I love to make things, and I love to make things from scratch. Clay has been one of my huge love affairs. It's such an interesting medium to work with. Also though, like life, so many things can happen along the way. It's a sort of like a great life lesson to work with clay. I was 29 years old the first time I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I didn't know what cancer was. There'd never been any cancer in the family. And I remember one of these crazy things people say to you. One of my friends from LA who had called to check up on me when I told him I had cancer, he said, oh, so they're gonna cut your breasts off? That image has stayed with me ever since. It's just absolutely terrifying and frightening. I finally found an oncologist in Los Angeles. She got all my pathology re-examined. The analysis is only as good as the eyes of the pathologist looking at the sample. So it's an art as well as a science to be able to discover it. It was a discussion about risks and benefits. She recommended chemo and I did radiation as well. There was no internet at that point on which to look up stuff about cancer. So I did it the old fashioned way with books and resource, finding resources and learning as much as possible and going to, you know, events and talking to doctors and talking to other people. It's so easy to feel helpless and lost. For the patient, it's so important to be able to find areas where you can have control, where you can have power to feel like you are a part of this, that you're not being done to. When I discovered Capoeira, that was it. There was just no going back. I felt completely and utterly called to it. My healing journey from cancer has only been, you know, helped by it. I can't even tell you how much. I just do it for joy. The bonus is that it makes you fit. Using the internet allowed me to broaden my horizons and get a comprehensive view of the state of medical research and how that affects me. I started a Tumblr account and I started using Twitter. I thought, I'm gonna try and just do a little bit of blogging, maybe a little bit of tweeting about breast cancer and see what that feels like. I would start to see the same people with similar interests participating in the same conferences or tweet chats and without trying to, started to build relationships. How can I use what I have gone through to help others? I've gained a certain amount of knowledge and wisdom and maybe I can pass that on. And at least this has been for a reason. Please welcome Lisa Bernstein. Hello, I'm Lisa Bernstein, and I've had cancer three times. Come with me back in time and picture this. A state-of-the-art, brand-new, celebrity-worthy breast center in Los Angeles. From the outside, this building is so sparkly, it broadcasts hope, optimism, and the promise of the best care money can buy. I'm inside, though, waiting in the mammography waiting area. Oodles of dollars have been poured into this building, but for some reason, the waiting area, it's really just a hallway. I'm there because I've just had my zillionth mammogram, and I'm waiting to be told what to do next. I'm also waiting to find out if I have cancer again. And I'm not alone. There are several of us, all of us, faceless female blobs of misery, each of us sitting there in our hospital gowns, each of us making heroic efforts to pretend we're normal and that we cannot see each other, each of us oozing acute levels of scanxiety. And then I hear it, Ms. Bernstein! It's the imaging tech, and she's at the other end of the hallway. And before I can even get up out of my seat, she says at the top of her voice, you're fine, you can go home now. I go up to her and I ask her how she knows this. The radiologist told her. Without even thinking, within nanoseconds, I've switched to survival mode and adrenaline is flowing. I respectfully ask if I can see the radiologist. 
I register the panic, annoyance, and resistance my extreme request causes in the tech's eyes, but something inside me makes me hold fast. I'm cringing because A, my privacy has just been violated, and B, I'm wondering how do all the other women in the waiting area feel now that they've heard my fabulous news? I've been treated like this many times before, but I've never quite known how or dared to stand up for myself like this before. After a while, I'm ushered into a dark room. I greet the man in the white coat. I look him in the eye, introduce myself, and in the way I hold out my hand, give him no choice but to shake mine. We share a smile. Ah, we've just interacted as people. I sense the calming energy of mutual respect. He confirms, yes, these are my films. Yes, he's compared them to the last ones. Nothing's changed. Thank you very much. Shake hands and goodbye. In less than two minutes, I am now reassured within science's best ability to reassure me that I can be scanxiety free for another six months because I have it from the horse's mouth. I can also leave without being helpless, bullied, or victimized. I've spent a lot of time pondering this incident because it's a defining moment in my development as an e-patient. For me, it epitomizes how I went from being gobbled up by the cancer machine to hacking the healthcare system. And it's all about dignity. Maybe I'm obsessed with dignity because I was born in South Africa under apartheid, so I know a little something about the opposite of dignity, indignity. Indignity permeated our lives, regardless for skin color. We privileged white people. We were dirtied by the indignity that was enshrined in our country's constitution. Indignity backfired on us. Maybe I'm obsessed with dignity because as a small child at a Jewish elementary school, I was taught in depth and with pictures all about the Holocaust and the people who survived it. The number one lesson I learned there is one I've clung to my entire life. It's also the lesson that, as it happens, the great South African, Nelson Mandela, embodies. Regardless of your circumstances, no matter how dire and dehumanizing, they can never take your dignity away from you unless you let them. So what's my point? Here's a hospital so concerned with its image that it spends millions on the new building. But the systems are designed for its maximum efficiency. The many, many doctors that I've interacted with at this hospital are top-notch, and they're eager to view me as a partner in my own care. But I've always wondered why, excuse me, I've always wondered why the support staff has consistently lived on the spectrum between Harried and Kurt. I'd rather be in a less pretty building with a system that treats all of its patients and all of its employees with simple human dignity and respect. We must remember this. Dignity is invisible. It doesn't show up as a line item in the operating budget. But dignity is just as crucial to all of us as oxygen. And as we continue to innovate together at the intersection of medicine and technology, here at Medicine X and beyond, we must breathe dignity into everything that we do. Dignity is on us. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.